Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'm glad to be here today and uh, be with all of you who are uh, inventing the future at the edge. And so what I want to uh, offer you today is a couple stories. Uh, not technology, not a product announcement, but just a couple of stories about how some of us got here in a way you might not have imagined. The title of the talk is Days of Future Past, and for those of you old enough to remember, it was a Moody Blue song. Uh, but it's also about entrepreneurs who invented the future. Um, so just some definitions at first. I tend to think of the life cycle of a startup to a large company as starting on the box on the left, that startups exist for one reason. A startup is an organization used to search for a repeatable and scalable business model. It's the only reason there's such an organization. Entrepreneurs are the individuals who are great at doing anything necessary to find that business model. And as companies evolve from left to right, they go through a transition, which is a polite way for saying that most entrepreneurs don't make the transition. And then they eventually become large companies. And in large companies, different people take over and execute this found and known business model. But when you're a startup, the skills needed to search and find this business model are agility, tenacity, resilience, innovation, pattern recognition skills, things we see and hear about every day when we hear the stories and see at conferences like this, successful entrepreneurs. And in large companies, this is the execution of a business model. This is where companies grow from small ideas into billion-dollar organizations. Here you need focus, you need process, you need plans, you need to manage personnel, and you need to execute. And what I'm going to do today is give you four stories about entrepreneurs and how they grew their companies or organizations. And the first story is about why Silicon Valley is in Boston. And it's the story of Fred Terman and James Killian, Stanford versus MIT. The father of Silicon Valley is not, as some of my students used to remind me in Stanford, Steve Jobs. It's, when I asked him to think about somebody really old, that's who they kept coming up with. Um, it's kind of a little sad. Um, it's not even Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, who we'll talk about in a second. It's not even Hewlett and Packard. The irony is, of course, when I ask this question, we're standing in the Terman Engineering Building. Uh, and the father of Silicon Valley is a guy you've probably never heard of called Fred Terman. Terman was a professor of engineering at Stanford in the 1930s, became dean of the engineering school in the 40s, and the provost in the 1950s. But what's really interesting about his story is he became the expert of the high tech of his era, which was radio engineering, and wrote the textbook. And when World War II broke out, the US government enlisted professors and graduate students in enormous technical projects, some of which you might have heard of, called the Manhattan Project, making the atomic bomb, and some of which you, some of which you may never have heard of which is building radar at the MIT Radiation Laboratory. And one I'll guarantee you you never heard of is building electronic warfare devices to shut down the German air defense system that US and British bombers needed to fly through in World War II. Fred Terman was drafted figuratively by the US military to build a research and development group located in Harvard and he built 800 of the best radio engineers to build these devices, and he became the father of electronic warfare. When he came back to Stanford in the 1950s, he continued his work in this field, except this time it was in secret. Terman turned Stanford into the arms center for the National Security Agency and the CIA. 
And by the way, in World War II, when the military was doling out R&D dollars, Stanford got all of $50,000 for teacher training. The U.S. military at the time thought Stanford's engineering department wasn't any good at all. In fact, the only good person there was Terman, which is why they took him back east. Now, contrast this to this guy. He ran what could be considered the technology empire, MIT. In the 20th century, MIT was the center of engineering in the United States. East Coast school, been there forever, and had deservedly a spectacular reputation. Guy who ran it, James Killian. President of MIT, had tons of military labs. And by the way, in World War II, when Stanford got $50,000 in government R&D, MIT got $117 million. $50,000, $117 million. But in the 1950s, when Terman returns to Stanford, his goal is to make Stanford the center of engineering in microwaves and electronics and match MIT contract to contract. And this scrappy university that didn't even show up on the radar in electronics pre-World War II by the 1960s becomes preeminent in military electronics. Terman versus Killian. Stanford versus MIT. MIT in the 50s and 60s turns into, the, in the middle of the Cold War, the electronics arms merchant for the U.S. military. Builds the Sage Air Defense System. Builds missile guidance systems. Stanford turns into the arms merchant for the CIA and NSA, building electronics intelligence and electronics warfare equipment. But Terman does something at Stanford that's unique. Starting in the 1950s, he starts encouraging his students and his faculty to leave Stanford with all the intellectual property they wanted to take and start companies. He decided that unlike MIT, Stanford should not get into the production business, that it should be individual companies around Palo Alto and Mountain View that were actually going to build systems. Entrepreneur, entrepreneur. Terman versus Killian. The rise of Silicon Valley is another interesting story. It's called Silicon Valley. Unlike Terman's vision, which would have been Microwave Valley, it's called Silicon Valley. And many people don't think long enough about how did it happen. The first Silicon company in what became Silicon Valley was started by this guy. William Shockley. It's a name that most of you probably don't know. But Shockley came out of AT&T's Bell Research Labs. He was the co-inventor of the transistor in 1947, and in 1956, he won the Nobel Prize for this work. Shockley decides that he doesn't want to work in a research lab for a big company, so he leaves AT&T and travels to Mountain View, California, and sets up the first semiconductor company on the West Coast. It's the first guy to bring silicon to the valley. But while he was the first, the founders of Silicon Valley are two people that you might have heard of, Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce. Moore and Noyce didn't have this pedigree. They didn't win Nobel Prizes. They didn't even work in large research labs. They were just great engineers. And they went off to found two companies, just two. One called Fairchild Semiconductor, the other called Intel. Every chip company in Silicon Valley traces their lineage to the companies these two guys started. And rightly so, they are remembered as the founders of Silicon Valley. But what's interesting is Shockley 
versus noise and more. Shockley started Shockley Semiconductor, and if we were to draw the org chart of all chip companies in Silicon Valley in 1956, this would be the diagram. There it is. Shockley Semiconductor. But what happened is Noyce and Moore actually came out to Mountain View, California to work for Shockley. And they found out that he was the world's worst manager. I'm sure some of you are thinking, no, 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 I work for the world's worst manager, but I think this guy set the record. And after 15 months, eight of his best people leave Shockley Semiconductor, including Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore. Noyce and Moore go off, as I mentioned, and found Fairchild and Intel. And while you can't read this eye chart here, it basically shows that in 20 years after they left Shockley and started Fairchild Semiconductor, 65 chip companies, 65, every chip company in Silicon Valley were spin-offs from either Fairchild or later Intel. These were the founders of Silicon Valley. But what happened to Shockley? Moise and, uh, Moore and Noyce create a $100 billion industry and transform the world. Shockley sold his company once, sold it again, got shut down. That's what his diagram looks like. He dies alone, unsuccessful. This was a big company guy, horrible manager, founder. World's best pedigree, world's worst manager, world's best talent spotter. But it was his way or the highway. And the two guys who picked the highway were the entrepreneurs. Moore and Noyce, founders of Silicon Valley. Another story, the rise of the personal computer. Most of you recognize this guy. Anybody know who that is? Right. I was going to use the police mugshot, but I thought that wasn't... Uh, there is one, by the way. Um, Bill Gates. So everybody knows the Bill Gates story. College dropout, I love to say that. Um, I love to say that because Bill Gates never would have even been asked to interview at Google. Um, Microsoft, for most of you don't know, had nothing to do with operating systems. For the first four years of the company's life, it made computer languages. Eventually got into something called Xenix, which was a Unix variant, but it was basically known for basic and, oh yeah, we do Fortran and COBOL and eventually Pascal. But in 1980, somebody came knocking on the door. It was the monolith of the computer, computing industry. It was IBM. And they were putting together a secret project to build a personal computer, and they needed an operating system. Their first choice had been CPM from Digital Research in Monterey. And for lots of reasons, that looked like it wasn't going to work out. And they were visiting Microsoft to license their languages for their, this new PC, and they happened to ask, hey, Know anybody who has an operating system that looks like CPM? And Bill Gates said, why, yes, we have one. And like Paul Allen looks across the table going, what, what, we don't have one? Yes, we'll show it to you tomorrow. He sold IBM an operating system he didn't even own. Went across town, licensed it for $25,000 from Seattle Computer, which he later paid another exorbitant $50,000 for all the rights. Now, the guy who was actually building the IBM PC inside of EPM, uh, IBM was Phil Estridge, a true innovator inside a massive company. Estridge was an IBM veteran, had worked there since 1959, but ran an internal skunk works 
a secret project far removed from IBM corporate in Armonk, New York. They stuck him down in Boca Raton, Florida. A, a city, if you've ever been there, you need a passport if you're under 75. Um, but he grew this division from 12 engineers to 10,000 employees in four years. One from zero to a million PCs, four years. From zero to billions of dollars in revenue, where no one at first at IBM even wanted to talk about a PC, to a division that became a political football inside of IBM. Gates versus Estridge. Gates was just supplicant. He was just going to license the software to IBM. IBM was going to offer DOS and CPM and other uh, operating systems as well. After four years, Estridge loses his division in political turf wars inside of IBM. They promote him to some great title, VP of manufacturing, whatever. He was never going to see his PC division again. And just as he was comp contemplating his future, he dies in a plane crash. My prediction was he would have left IBM within 18 months and joined some startup. Bill Gates became the world's richest man by beating Estridge's successor in control of the PC standard. Ruthless entrepreneur, why entrepreneurs leave big companies. Last story, the rise of the modern corporation, Durant versus Sloan. This one goes all the way back to the 1920s. The inventor of the modern corporation in the United States is a guy that if you've gone through business school, you might have heard of. Alfred P. Sloan. Lots of things named after him. Sloan School at MIT, Sloan Kettering Institute in New York City. Sloan truly was the president, CEO, and chairman of General Motors who revolutionized how large companies built and grew their organizations. He implemented an accounting system that allowed divisionalization so companies can actually grow larger without becoming monoliths, which between World War I and II allowed enormous growth inside the U.S. and post-World War II allowed companies to internationalize and globalize and still retain financial control of their systems. He was an accounting genius, truly the father of the modern corporation. But he wasn't the founder of General Motors. This guy was the founder. His name was Billy Durant. And the odds of any of you of ever hearing of this guy is probably zero. Durant had a great career. Before he built General Motors, he actually was the leader in horse buggies. Kind of like after watching the last pre presentation, probably like using Adobe Flash or something. Um, um, sorry. Um, but he actually saw the future and moved into cars. And he started buying up separate car companies and put together something called General Motors. And he was crazy, you know, buying this, running out of money all the time. So his board fired him. And he said, oh, yeah? Okay, well, I'm going to start another company. And he does. He starts a company called Chevrolet. Chevrolet grows bigger than all of General Motors. And he uses the profits from Chevrolet to buy up all the GM stock and throw out his board. <laughs> Buys the company back. Gets another 10 years as the crazy CEO of General Motors, which now includes Chevrolet. But finally, again, he runs out of money and has to go to the bankers. And the bankers this time are the DuPonts. And so they come in and look around and go, this guy's nuts. And they throw him out a second time. When they throw him out, GM is the equivalent in 1920 of, in today's dollars, of $3.6 billion. Durant versus Sloan. Sloan dies rich, honored, and famous. Durant dies managing a bowling alley, penniless. He was the accountant. He was the entrepreneur. Thank you.